found out because I was having panic attacks, and I had had panic attacks for quite a number of months, and I didn't really understand why I was having panic attacks, but I was, and um, about an hour after they left, they got very severe. I decided to uh, distract myself by turning on the television. There was a news flash not seconds later saying, um, there's a plane missing from the sky. They didn't know where or why or who it was, and I instantly knew. You don't want to hear this. It was that there had been a news flash that Pan Am 103 had gone down. We knew we had a number of students on the flight, but no idea of who or how many. And I stood there for a while, and we were the only two people in there, um, and listened as a newscast rolled along and rolled along, and slowly it began to occur to me that, wait a second, there's something absolutely wrong here. What's the matter? You're white as a sheep. And I said, well, I think it's a, lot, a lot of my friends just died in a plane crash. It was December 21st, 1988. 35 students from the Syracuse University Study Abroad program were on their way home from a semester in London when a bomb in a suitcase exploded, sending their plane to the ground. I was pretty much in shock, so I just kept saying, eight people are dead, and she's like, what's wrong? I said, just turn on your television. Eight people are dead. Eight people are dead. What are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, I was just with these guys. That's yeah, impossible. And when I left that morning, you know, I hugged my roommates. I never hugged any dudes at that time <laughs> in my life. and. Uh, I mean, we were really, we really had a wonderful time together. We grew up so much. The front page of every single newspaper in every single language from around the world had the same photograph. And it was a picture of the nose portion of, of the Pan Am jet. A single moment can change the world. A single moment leaves life unfurled. Stars come, stars go, and some explode. But in their death, new light is sowed. Forever in our mind's eye, your smiles shine and tears we cry. Oh yes, our, our souls gently weep, but we have those bright faces to keep, to hold, remember, to admire, to ignite within us life's desire. Back in London, their classmates and professors were reeling from the shock. You can't, you can't describe it. It's just complete incredulity, nobody should have to die like that, the injustice of it, the, the horror of it. All I can remember is there was just tears everywhere and people were crying, were hugging each other. With the help of the students we tried to piece together a reliable casualty list. We were constantly exchanging information with Norell at the Dipper. But even so, more than 24 hours were to elapse before we had what we thought was a complete list of names. I broke into an office and I um, found a manifest of the flight and that's how I learned who died. I was supposed to be on the plane and I changed my flight on a whim uh, two days before. Something that was very light then became very serious and very public and very international. It was a tragedy that hit several small communities from Syracuse to London and Lockerbie. Those involved say they were forever changed. There are moments where the public and the private intersect in your life that you never forget. I mean, an obvious cliched example is where the day that Kennedy was assassinated, I can tell you precisely where I was sitting. The same is true of Lockerbie. It's one of those moments where the private and the public intersect, and they're with you forever. And, and of course, you're never the same after these events have happened. When Tom Brokaw left the screen and sat next to me and started telling me that I was part of the story, um, that was the end of my childhood. From the moment all those friends were murdered, it is something that is always underneath. There's feelings of guilt, um, whether that's right or wrong. My roommates were like family to me. My, my parents had actually passed away two years before uh, I went to London. So at that time, when I look back on it, my roommates in London became sort of like a surrogate family to me, as did a lot of my friends I made at that time. Mm -hmm. And so the loss was, uh, it was very, um, it was deep. Theo and I were the kind of friends that um, are inseparable. You know, when you, when you have those friends that they're always together and you can't think of one without the other, it's the only time in my life I've had a friendship like that. So the hardest thing was, not only was I missing all of my friends, but that when people saw me, they, they saw that Theo wasn't next to me. Pan Am happened at a time when terrorism stayed overseas. 
terrorism didn't directly affect the United States as a whole, and it definitely didn't happen to 20-year-old college students. There was no model of how to deal with such tragedy, not diplomatically, not in the media, and not on campus. We wish that division of uh, DIPA had uh, brought us all together when we came back. We never did that. We had memorial services, but we never as a group got together again. I had ulcers. I was on, put on Prozac. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that they were trying to do to correct whatever stuff we're going through, but there was no, that wasn't, it wasn't, they couldn't fix it. I just spent a lot of time in my room. I lost a lot of weight. Um, it was really hard because at that age, I mean, I was 20, and at that age, you don't think that something like this is going to happen to you. I think just because the world hadn't really dealt with something like that, no one, no one knew what to do. You know, I don't think we were intentionally forgotten. I just think it was just, you know, everybody's like, all right, let's let's get on with it. And I think we did. With no email and no cell phones. Um, and this campus, right. it was really hard to find those people. They were all in different majors, they were all mm -hmm. in different schools, and we never had an opportunity to get together as a group and kind of lean on each other. When the tragedy hit, a memorial service was planned in Hendricks Chapel. Many students had already left for the semester, so the chaplains at the time knew the media was needed to bridge the gap. Media came from all over, zeroing in on one of the only places in the country so widely hit. And the media want ground rules. They want to know how you expect them to behave. Professor Joan Deppa has done research on media coverage of Pan Am 103 and says one of the reasons some media outlets acted poorly at the service was because there were no rules set forth. Because there was no public relations person to set the ground rules, which is what has to happen when you have a major news event. Um, we had things happening like um, uh, television cameras with lights glaring out into the quad so that as the students were coming across the quad to the chapel, looking to climb those steps and go in the door, what they were confronted wa with was this cameras and lights right in their face. The media was so intrusive. I remember being in Hendricks Chapel. Um, it was probably that first day, uh, and just with a lot of my friends, Heather and Robin, and everyone was crying, and, and just camera literally like right in our face. And I just remember being so angry at the media, like e even though I was a new house student. Mm -hmm. I did not know at the time that we had, during the service, people up in the balconies with video cameras doing live hits, standing there going, I'm so-and-so speaking to you from Hendrix Chapel while the service was going on. Depa says a lack of media management was seen at JFK too. Pan Am set up a media briefing room, but provided little or no information. With a lack of information and nearing deadlines, many reporters became desperate, looking for anything. That's when a mother, Jeannie Boulanger, came along. She saw someone in a Pan Am uniform and walked up to him and asked about Flight 103 and was told it had crashed. And she was absolutely overcome. She fell screaming to the floor, not my baby, not my baby. There were a whole bunch of television cameras and still cameras and reporters, and here this woman collapses in front of them. And they zoomed in. And we have pictures that show not only her on the floor, but the television cameras and the uh, photography cameras zeroing in on her. Reporters in London were just as desperate, camping outside the London Abroad Center. Within minutes, we were surrounded by media, just, just this uh, influx of cameras and reporters and you name it, and we were, were basically under siege. I'll never forget going in there in the press going, do you have pictures? Do you know who it was? Do you have pictures? I remember it being being very angry because it was something that was very personal and it became this media circus. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I wanted to tell them more about my friends. I didn't want it to just be, you know, the blurb on the news. International issues with Libya had been brewing for years. After the crash, sanctions on the country became even stronger. Libya was to pay the victims' families for their pain. Those payments have just recently been completed. While some families saw it as justice, others say millions of dollars won't bring their children back. We were opposed to that. I am opposed to it. I would gladly forego the money. They, Libya really hasn't changed. As long as Gaddafi is uh, the man in charge, they are a terrorist nation. And they certainly were back in 1988 and for years afterwards. American governments now have uh, ties with Libya again even though I think that Libya was 100% responsible for this. I think they haven't changed very much at all. Uh, to my deep regret, I do not think much has been learned at all. Um, but the injustice continues. Airplane safety is one lesson that was learned. Before Pan Am 103, bags weren't always matched with riders, and tickets weren't always matched with people. It was easy for a bag containing a bomb to fly alone. The crash revealed other information about the lack of security surrounding the flight, like bomb-sniffing dogs that weren't really trained for that, and security officers that weren't watching the x-ray machines carefully. Out of tragedy came some reform. For those who lived through Pan Am 103, September 11th was like another horrible dream. Since 1988, there's been a number of terrorist incidents, and those terrorist incidents, everyone you know, 9-11 obviously being the biggest, that triggered everything. Um, it was a, out of the playbook. I mean, planes were used. Again, the media had to cover terrorism that profoundly affected Americans. The hope was that 12 years later, lessons would have been learned. The media uh, play an important role in helping us to make sense out of things helping us to come to terms with them. But if the government does not play a leadership role in that process, then it becomes difficult. Deppa says government leadership with 9-11 was better because information was more available. And she says many journalists had a greater understanding of the importance of covering tragedy with sensitivity. The series that the New York Times did, where they did personal uh, interviews with family and or friends of all the people that perished in the World Trade Center. That kind of effort to memorialize individuals who, um, who died was very, very important. But she says she thinks there can still be improvement based on research she's done on the coverage of Iraq and Afghanistan war casualties. We've not done a very good job, especially in the major newspapers, of memorializing um, the uh, people in the armed services who died because of that event. So I think we still have things to learn. Syracuse University is one place that had learned about dealing with tragedy. When September 11th happened, the experience of Pan Am 103 helped the community know what and what not to do. We had on this campus a well-rehearsed set of, of, of people and who, who, who came through the Pan Am 103 with these wonderful relationships of trust. We've formalized that response that we started on December 21st. Um, we now have what's called a critical incident um, response committee that formally mm -hmm. has ways to respond to all of the bad things that might happen. We just had a very anxious community. So I suggested that at 3 o'clock that afternoon we gather anybody who wants to come to Hendricks Chapel. Mm -hmm. So we did our very best to broadly advertise that we're just going to have a gathering in the chapel. It's not going to be a religious gathering, it's just going to be a gathering. Mm -hmm. The reason I want the Quran read today as well as the Torah and as well as the Christian New Testament is because we're hearing on the news Islamic terrorists as if it's one word always fused together. 
And I said, what we've got to do is we've got to pry those two things apart and started chanting it in Arabic. And you could feel this, you know, all day long we've been hearing Islamic terrorists, Islamic terrorists, Islamic terrorists. And, um, and, uh, and you, could have, you, could, you could hear the <gasps> in the room. You could feel it. <gasps> and then he began to translate in English. And it was all about love and peace and justice. Since then, SU has also worked with other schools in setting up crisis plans. I can think of very, very few events that shape an institution forever the way Lockerbie did. When Lockerbie happened, nobody knew what to do. There was no protocol, there was no, there was no disaster emergency protocol, there was no protocol for how to handle staff um, or what staff reactions. Everybody just got on with it because there was no other reference. Unlike, for example, the role that Syracuse is now playing with Virginia Tech and advising Virginia Tech. Relationships continue to flourish between SU and Lockerbie, the two communities never forgetting the extremely strong bond they both share. The people of Lockerbie took every possession that was found, sorted through, tried to find who it belonged to, took all the clothing, washed, ironed, folded, packaged it all to make sure it went back to the families with sprigs of heather and uh, a note or something. They prayed over bodies in the field that couldn't be moved for a number of days. The Lockerbie scholars are one way that relationship is kept strong. Two students travel to SU every year to study abroad. Larry Mason is an SU professor who has just finished a gift to the town, a book of photographs and stories that tells the true story of the community, not just the tragedy. The book that we've produced is, is really about friendship. It's, it's not a book about Pan Am 103 although it deals with it, it shows the sites, it talks about the impact and why we were drawn there. But this is a book about friendship between two communities and you know, I feel very comfortable with that, that 20 years later we've been able to do some work that produces some good out of a disaster. He says the lesson to be learned from that is that love can be found in the darkest of experiences, but perhaps the biggest lesson learned is the importance of keeping memories alive. What's extraordinary is, is, is the presence, the living presence of this event in this, in this university, which I suppose lots of us have not put out of our minds, but have learned to live with. I mean, I, I walk past the great um, mural in, in the centre in London every, every Monday morning when I teach, and I leave in Monday afternoon, and it's, it's there. I know about this. I know about Lockerbie. I've been to Lockerbie. But somehow, it senses the presence has only come through to me again, you know, these 20 years later being here, these few days. Remembrance Week and the Remembrance Scholars are just one way the university has vowed never to forget. The 35 students research and represent those lost 20 years ago. The scholars and students at SU are becoming more and more removed from the tragedy, but they say that doesn't matter. I'm so proud of the way this campus has continued to remember these students in this tragedy. Um, as you've heard a million times, I'm sure, students, our undergraduates today were either very small children or not born when this happened. Mm -hmm. So it's hard, it's hard to understand why, why this is still so fresh in a lot of our minds, but I think we've always done a really good job of making sure that this, that these students weren't forgotten. And it amazes me that 20 years later, you know, I remember them more than I remember the students that was here maybe last <laughs> semester because of, you know, That's so right, many people tragedy. have worked so hard you know, to just keep the memory alive. I think our job is just to make sure that current students don't forget and learn about what Pan Am 103 was and learn about why it's important and why it's still significant in their lives, even though they were born afterwards. Other remembrance programs have been set up too, like the Alexia Foundation, set up by the family of Pan Am 103 victim, Alexia Tesseris. The, the, the primary mission is to, to help photographers produce work that will bring understanding of different cultures uh, 
which we hope will will decrease hostilities when people understand each other better or they don't fight so much. Alexia was also a photojournalist. The program set up in her name provides workshops and awards. It also helps students study photography all over the world. We've had um, a couple of people who just won awards of excellence, not top awards. Uh, one that, that told us uh, five years later after he won uh, national uh, Press Photographers of the Year, uh, Photographer of the Year said that, that the Alexia Award of Excellence was the first thing that he ever won and he had been discouraged with photography and that kept him going. And, and he just a few years later became Newspaper Photographer of the Year. And we hear that over and over and over again where not only are m many, many of our, our people producing really, really strong documentary photography that has its own change in the world, but it's changed those individuals' lives. This 20th anniversary also marked the first time many students from the class of 88 London Abroad all made their way back to campus together. With them also came several professors who taught abroad. We specially reached out to people who were in that fall 88 program in London who, who were with these students, mm -hmm. who lived with them and studied with them and loved them, you know, and, and came home without them. Um, this is a group that I think really needed to come back and needed to get together and needed to be together um, because there's still a lot of pain, there's still a lot of emotion there. Twenty years ago, these students never made their way back together to help each other through what many describe as the toughest time of their lives. Now, just talking through it again is acting as a healing agent. The last 24 hours or so have been, you know, a bit of a roller coaster. And, you know, not to be tried, it's both bitter and sweet. Uh, it's sweet to try to, um, you know, celebrate what we've done amongst ourselves. And every time we talk about what we've done amongst ourselves while we were there, um, the others, the other 35, were there too. I'm looking forward to having this, this community, but and I think it's going to help more going forward. We spent an entire weekend focused on this, and we've had some amazing cries and some amazing laughs and remembrances, but all those people are frozen in time for us. Tears and laughs, but they say the laughs are most important. That the semester was so much more than it, and you know, as I said, it ended so horribly, uh, but it was such an amazing opportunity. That it was the, the, the best time of our lives. It was just a really amazing special crew, um, from the professors all the way. Um, even talking to some professors that have done numerous times abroad, and they said there was just something, even without the crash, there was something about the people. We used to have these American football games in uh, Kensington Garden, which is right outside of Kensington Palace. We'd take a, a spot of that and, uh, you know, whoever could show up, whoever was in town or in country uh, that weekend on Sundays, we'd get together and we'd, we'd play just American football. Everybody else was playing cricket or, or soccer or whatever. And it was always amusing to see the uh, some of the British folks who would come by and kind of look at us like, what the heck are they doing? You know, They had made the decision that each of them was going to take something, some delicacy, on the plane, and they were going to add to the, the Pan Am's rather austere or uh, uh, meals and things, and they were going to have a party on the plane. It's the first thought that struck me was, up there, they were really enjoying themselves. They were having a party, and really, that's the end of the story. Theo uh, was uh, this um, firecracker of a human being, short, long, black hair, raven-like hair. Um. Karen was the kind of person that everyone loved. She was um, inner strength, outer beauty. She was like everything feminine, and yet she was extremely strong. Nick and Scott. The two guys that lived in back of us, they're crazy guys, great guys. Uh, you know, their forte was sort of um, challenging the policemen, the Bobbies, in, uh, in Hyde Park, and they were famous for it, you know. 
So <laughs> you'd see the Bobbies running by, uh, <laughs> chasing them. And Bobbies actually ended up being good friends with us. Nicholas Venus had a certain characteristic. He was always in at the last minute. And he was, but, and this is the important thing, he had a most wonderful smile. So you were completely disarmed. He, so I always called him Smiler. My thinking about Pan Am 103 and Lockerbie has often centered around Alexia and Julianne because when I think of the disaster, theirs are the faces that come into my head the first. And I, I knew I had to get a photograph of this because it was going to go away really fast. I got a couple of frames. It lasted about 15 seconds maybe. But the, the, the spookiest thing to me was that, again, I had Alexia and Julianne's face flash into my mind at that point when I was shooting the picture. And this is what the shock was to me, that instead of that, seeing them tortured, they seemed to be smiling. They seemed to be at peace. This is, this is what I saw in, in my mind's eye. And I was puzzled by that, but it gave me a sense of closure, which is ultimately what I wanted in Lockerbie. I wanted to get a sense of closure. It was not until six months later, about approximately six months later, that I learned from the Tessaris family that Alexia had been found in that field where I shot that picture. I learned two years later that Julianne was found in that field. 20 years later, lessons have been learned. Others will take longer. But those truly hit by this tragedy say the biggest lessons they've learned are how to make peace with tragedy, how to keep living, and how to never forget those they loved. For so long, this story lived outside of me. Um, you know, it belonged to the politicians and the media. 20 years later, it sort of feels like I realize now that they that they are part of me.